This is a patient I actually saw in the uh, ophthalmology clinic where he got shot in the eye by one of his buddies with that, uh, with that uh, air gun. So, and he's just got a small little, um, uh, uh, yeah, small little hyphema just right in there. So, that is cool. Um, so, traumatic hyphema involves blood in the anterior chamber subsequent to a blow or a projectile striking the eye. Uh, complications. The number one, one that we're concerned about is a re-bleed, which often occurs at about two to five days when the clot retracts and loosens. Um, you can get some visual loss, you can get some corneal staining, acute or chronic glaucoma, anterior or posterior synechiae, so where the, um, uh, where the pupil actually adheres to the, uh, to the lens. Um, sorry, the iris adheres to the cornea in the anterior one or adheres to the lens in the posterior sneaky eye. Uh, you can get traumatic cataract or optic atrophy. So there's a grading system for hyphema, which it really doesn't matter in the eMERGE because if we see one, you know, we're pretty much going to call ophthalmology anyways. But, uh, you know, here's the grading system. So less than a third is a grade one, between a third and a half is a grade two, grade three is greater than half, but not the whole eye. And then the eight ball is the, uh, the grade four, so it's fully, uh, the whole interior chamber is full. Management of hyphema in the ED involves, you know, elevating the head of the bed, uh, limiting eye movement, limiting reading, things like that. So you're not getting as much uh, eye movement. Uh, patch or shield, analgesia. In some things, like Rosen would say, would say to avoid ASA, uh, you know, to try and prevent the rebleed. Interestingly, I mean, interestingly enough, one of the things they looked at in this systematic review was using ASA. Um, to treat a hyphema. Antiemetics, because you don't really want people vomiting and increasing their intraocular pressure, uh, maybe causing a rebleed there. And then eye drops in the ED, so like acycloplegic, myotics, some beta blockers, carbonic, and carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. Um, some of the other things, antifibrinolytics, uh, including aminocaproic acid, so not something we're prescribing in the eMERGE. Uh, something that's usually done by uh, ophthalmology, and something that in the past has required hospital admission and uh, IV administration of the aminocaproic acid, tranexamic acid, and uh, corticosteroids. So the objective of this systematic review was to review the literature to assess the effectiveness of interventions in the management of traumatic hyphema. So the, they searched, uh, you know, Cochrane, MBase, uh, Meta Register of Controlled Trials, clinicaltrials.gov, and then they'd go through the reference list of all the articles that they got as well. They had two authors independently assessing the titles and abstracts, and then uh, from there deciding which ones to pull, which articles to see. When there was a disagreement, the two authors would try and come to consensus. When they couldn't do that, they had a third party come in and make a decision. So. They ended up actually looking at 61 uh, full text copies, uh, narrowed it down to 26 articles that were included after reviewing a total of 836. 19 of these were randomized controlled trials and seven were quasi randomized trials. So a little bit of statistic stuff, which um, after spending a long time with Shelly trying to help me get my head around it. Um, in meta-analyses, you using you often use an I squared value, which is something to see how it's a statistic to see how uh, heterogeneous the trials are. So um, the uh, lower the I squared value, it means that if there's variability within the uh, within the results of the trials, it's more likely due to uh, a chance, as opposed to if it's a high I squared value the uh, variability between the trials uh, means that the trials are probably different enough that they shouldn't have been pooled together. So looking for a low I-squared statistic to say that yes, the trials are pretty similar um, and that it's appropriate to uh, compare them. In this study, they said they were looking for an I-squared value, um, or basically if there's an I-squared value is greater than 40%, they thought that there was, um, statistical heterogeneity uh, between the trials, so that potentially at that point in time we're starting to get more variability between the trials 
and making it a little bit more difficult to, uh, to compare them. Um, when comparing trials, you can use a fixed effects model, which basically it's a model that accounts for in-trial variability, but not variability across the trials. So if the trials have a low I-squared statistic, we're thinking they're fairly similar, we use a fixed effects model, and then as they get uh, more variable, you use a random effects model which accounts for in-trial variability as well as across trial variability. So I don't know if that makes sense, but it took me a long time to get my head around it, but uh, I'll just mention it. it'll come up in a, in a couple slides as well. So basically, the takeaway is they're saying, you know, if our I-squared value is greater than 40%, we're seeing statistical heterogeneity. And at that point in time, you'd think that they'd switch over to a random effects model to account for the variability between the trials. There, I'm done with that. So their clinical question in this uh, study, well, was a few. They looked at antifibrinolytics versus control. And so within that category, they looked at oral aminocaproic acid versus placebo. And of the 26 trials, six of the trials looked at that. They looked at low dose versus standard dose of aminocaproic acid. They looked at oral versus topical. They looked at tranexamic acid versus control. There was five studies that looked at that. They looked at aminomethylbenzoic acid, which is another antifibrinolytic versus placebo. They looked at aminocaproic acid versus oral prednisone. They looked at corticosteroids versus control. They looked at conjugated estrogen. They looked at psychoplegics versus myotics. They looked at aspirin. They looked at monocular versus binocular patching. They looked, like just on and on. In the end, they had 13 clinical questions that they were looking at in this meta-analysis, all of them very different. And as you can see, as you go through the list, there's only two, two clinical questions they looked at where they had two or they had more than two trials to even look at it. So they're essentially doing a meta-analysis on you know, some, a, a clinical question with one study. So, you know, pretty broad and dealing with a lot of things and, you know, really got to the point that things got watered down. So I went to Guyet for my advice on, you know, how to look at a systematic analysis and, or systematic review. And the first thing they do is make a comparison between a narrative review and a systematic review. And Basically, in the narrative review, you're looking at several questions, it's general, whereas in the systematic review, it's a focused question, specific population, and there's an intervention, or exposure, or outcome. Very directed question. I'm not saying this was a narrative review, but man, it had a lot of qualities like that because it was just so broad. And trying to approach it, I was like, well, what do I talk about now? Because you guys don't want to hear about the 13 different clinical questions we'd be here forever. So they kind of took this shotgun approach at managing hyphema. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at basically two things. I'm going to look at the two um, clinical questions that they had more than two trials to look at. So first thing, aminocropoic acid versus placebo. They had six studies comparing these. In total, there's 330 participants. What they found when they, they looked at um, different outcomes for all of these interventions, Visual acuity being one, there was no statistical difference between the aminocaproic acid versus the placebo. It got a little bit difficult because every trial was assessing visual acuity at different times as well. And um, their basic uh, approach to visual acuity was, you know, is your visual acuity between 2020 to 2040? And that would be, um, uh, that would be your uh, adequate visual acuity. And if there was greater or was worse than that, then they're saying there's potentially a change. So also looking at this, they looked at time to resolution of the primary hemorrhage. And uh, in the aminocaproic acid uh, group, it actually uh, took longer to resolve the clot or for the hyphema to resolve. Um, so they did forest plots. Looking at, uh, for this one, it's just basically looking at the risk of secondary hemorrhage, which is, you know, why we're giving the antifibrinolytics. We want to prevent a secondary hemorrhage. The risk of the secondary hemorrhage being, you know, potential effects on visual acuity. 
But we already said there was no effect on visual acuity. The aminocaproic acid did have uh, a reduced risk or reduced incidence of um, a rebleed, and they did find it to be statistical. But in the end, we're dealing with 30 events. So, you know, you wonder that's, you know, is this going to be practice changing? Well, we're saying statistically significant, but it's based on 30 events. You know, I'm not sure that's enough once we've done our meta-analysis with six trials to, to say that um, I would definitely change my practice. And the other thing, this, this is the only other time I'll mention statistics. So if you look in the corner here, it says the I squared statistic was 48%. So at 48%, they're already greater than their um, statistical heterogeneity. And with that, you'd think that they'd switch over to the random effects model, but in this one, they actually use the fixed effects model. So um, using uh, Shelley, we sat down and she actually calculated what this would be like if, they, if you used a fixed effects model, or sorry, if we used a random effects model. And basically what it did is it just broadened the uh, confidence interval almost to the point that you know, your, your odds ratio is close to one. So then I went through and assessed the trials, basically looking at uh, you know, criteria. And in the aminocaproic acid uh, versus placebo, you know, we looked at uh, randomization. You know, they were all randomized. There's two of the studies where they weren't really clear how randomization occurred. Um, in five of the six studies, they weren't really clear whether, you know, the allocation of randomization was concealed. Um, all the patients and all the personnel were blinded in all six of the studies, and uh, two out of six of them did not use an intention to treat analysis. So, okay, next one, tranexamic acid. So there's five studies in the tranexamic acid uh, clinical question. Three of them were randomized controlled trials. Two of them were quasi-randomized controlled trials. They had variable doses. Um, and in some of them, they were actually comparing tranexamic acid to, well, conservative management, like there's no placebo involved. Um, one of them, it controlled tranexamic acid to uh, placebo and to prednisone. So just looking at the function of tranexamic acid and how it works, again, it's an antifibrinolytic. Uh, so the goal is to prevent the rebleed. And the theorized mechanism of tranexamic acid is to um, uh, prevent, basically block uh, pleasant plasminogen or plasmin um, uh, attachment to fibrin. So you're basically not allowing the plasmin to attach and not allowing the fibrin uh, breakdown. So, looking at a couple of their endpoints, visual acuity, again, showed no statistical difference. There's only three trials that actually looked at this, which, you know, you think if you're in an ophthalmologically based trial, you'd, you'd want to be looking at visual acuity, but only three out of five of them looked at it. Um, no statistical difference. You can kind of see it sort of trended towards um, favoring the antifibrinolytics. Secondary hemorrhage, there was a statistical difference in the, um, uh, with showing benefit with the tranexamic acid. Uh, odds ratio of 0.25 with the confidence interval being from 0.13 to 0.49. You know, again, with this one, we're looking at five studies, but really two of the studies comprised 73% uh, of all the patients. So, um, and there was only 29 events in the one study and 14 events in the other. So again, we're having a small amount of events um, that we're actually measuring here. Um, some of the other endpoints they looked at, risk of corneal blood staining, only two studies looked at that and only one patient in those studies had it. Uh, no uh, synechiae was reported. Um, and there's no statistical difference in the uh, intraocular pressures. So again, assessing the studies. Four of them were randomized, um, but uh, the random methods of randomization was not revealed in any of these randomized studies. You know, how they, uh, how they did the allocation concealment was not mentioned or unclear in four of the five of them. Patients were only blinded in one of these studies. Personnel were only blinded in two of the studies, 
and intention to treat analysis in four of the five. So, you know, again, you now you're looking at, you're saying there's statistical difference, but you're looking at the quality of the studies involved and I don't know, there's not much blinding. We're not really sure how you're randomizing the patients. And uh, again, there's, you know, small amount of outcomes and it's basically based on two trials again. So even though they had five trials, we're basing it mostly on, on two of the trials. So some of the other things they looked at in, in the other uh, clinical questions, corticosteroids versus control, um, basically showed no statistical difference in visual acuity, um, no difference in time to uh, resolution of primary hemorrhage, no difference in secondary hemorrhage. Uh, cycloplegics versus meiotics, you know, they basically showed no statistical difference in any of these. Again, it was two studies, 128 patients, um, and only one patient had a rebleed. So, you know, critical appraisal. Are the results valid? It's the first question. Well, you know, to start off with, the clinical question was so broad and they covered so many topics, you know, I just found that the systematic review just got really watered down. And even in the, in the couple questions where they had a few studies to look at, um, you know, in the trans acid, the quality of the studies were, you know, so-so at best. In the um, aminocoproic acid studies, the events were so low that, you know, it's tough to make any comment on uh, um, the validity of these. They did have an exhaustive study though. I mean, did a decent review. They just didn't come up with many trials. Um, again, 19 of them were randomized controlled trials. 10 were quasi-randomized. 10 of the studies were not blinded in total. Follow-up was often not complete. And then as I went through and looked at their, uh, their chart where they did an overall assessment of all the trials they, they did, um, eight of their uh, 26 trials when they assessed them, thought eight of the 26 had adequate sequence generation or adequate randomization. So in 30% of your trials in your systematic review, you said, oh yeah, the randomization was all right. In eight out of 26, the allocation concealment they thought was adequate or, or appropriate. Um, in half, there was blinding for the participants. In half, there was blinding for the personnel. And, uh, you know, in 70%, they thought that the uh, that the data was followed up on appropriately. So again, looking at the quality of trials that go into this systematic review and it's kind of pretty suspect. So what are the results? Well, you know, we kind of went through some of the results, but most of them are based on one or two studies. And they basically showed that no intervention had a significant effect on visual acuity, that Amino caproic acid and tranexamic acid had a significant benefit in reducing the risk of rebleed, um, but it didn't affect visual acuity. Amino caproic acid prolongs the resolution of the hyphema. There's no evidence to support the benefit of uh, corticosteroids, cycloplegics, bed rest, head elevation, patching one eye versus both eyes. So applying the results to clinical practice. Well, you know, looking at amino caproic acid, we don't use it in the ED anyways. It's going to be an ophthalmologic drug. Um, so, you know, I think that one sort of stays in the same situation. You know, tranexamic acid, it is a drug that we do use in the ED, um, not often in the setting of hyphema. You know, I think it's something that, you know, in consultation with ophthalmology, if, if they're wanting it, if we mention it to them and they're saying, yeah, you yeah, might as well go ahead, then, you know, I think it's reasonable. I think theoretically it makes sense to why it, why it would work. I think there's pretty weak evidence that it works, but there's no, there was no evidence of harm. Corticosteroids, you know, there's no evidence of benefit. Patching, I think we're going to patch anyways. Um, head of the bed up, you know, shows no benefit. You know, I think we're going to do that anyways. And if anything, for the benefit of the patient, you know, because you, you'll just notice that if they have a hyphema and the head of the bed is up, you know, uh, the red cells are going to, uh, just by gravity, fall to the, to the lower aspect of the eye and out of the visual axis. So they just basically improve the vision. So, and that's it. That's what I got.